All right. I, I, I welcome you. <laughs> okay. Okay, well, let's start. Okay. So let uh, say first, thank you very much for the opportunity to have an interview with you for the Richard Dawkins Foundation in Germany. Um, uh, let's start with some questions about your CV. You were born in Beirut to a Jewish family. And uh, how has your Jewish identity uh, shaped you well, uh, when you became an atheist? You know, I, it, it started when I was probably around five or six years old and we would go to synagogue in Lebanon and I would ask uh, typically my father, you know, why are we doing this? Why are we standing up now? Why are we sitting down now? And the usual answer that I got back was sort of quite dismissive. Just do, just do it. Just follow, right? And uh, maybe already my intellectual mind was developing. I didn't really like those answers. I didn't like the idea of simply doing something because somebody else wanted me to do. And so already I had started to feel somewhat suspicious of religion, even at a very young age. And then, of course, I was in Lebanon during the Civil War. I saw the amount of hatred that religion engenders, and certainly the hatred towards the Jews, we had to escape Lebanon because otherwise it wouldn't have ended up nicely for us. And so very early in life, I knew that while I was very Jewish in terms of my earthly identity, right? I mean, in the same way that you could love Bayern Munich or you could love uh, Borussia Dortmund, uh, those are very earthly things. They're very real things. They are... Uh, part of the reasons that we affiliate with the in-group members and we disassociate from the out-group members. So in that sense, I'm very Jewish because I'm part of a lineage, I'm part of a history, I'm part of a people, uh, I'm part of a shared story. But the religious elements, I quickly let go of very early in life. So this is more a cultural identity. It is a cultural identity. Uh, of course. The traditions. Exactly. Now, of course, there is part of being Jewish at the start is to technically believe in certain religious narratives. But as you know, m probably most of the most famous Jewish people in history that you could name were all very Jewish and yet very atheist. And so... Uh, for those who are so oftentimes uh, confused, uh, I think it's because they don't recognize that uh, Judaism is, is a multifaceted identity, one of which is to adhere to religious doctrines, right? I mean, I eat pork. Uh, that doesn't somehow remove me from being Jewish. But of course, it is a kosher taboo to eat pork. And so in that sense, I'm able to both B belong to a group, but also reject all of the religious, uh, you know, stories. You take the best sides <laughs> and take, leave the bad side yeah, exactly. behind. I'll take I'll take Einstein. I'll leave out Deuteronomy. <laughs> That's very good. So uh, you mentioned Lebanon, where, where you born, where you were born. Uh, what were your experiences in Lebanon? So up to when the civil war broke out. So I left Lebanon when I was 11. Uh, and then we moved to Montreal, Canada. Uh, we in the were, 17th. No? In the 70s, right. So I was in Lebanon for the first year of the civil war, slightly less than the full year. Uh, but I had seen enough to last multiple lifetimes in terms of the, the butchery, the savagery, the hatred, the violence. And uh, But prior to that, my life in Lebanon was... Uh, Was a, was a happy one in that, you know, Lebanon was a beautiful country. I used to play football all the time, go to the beach all the time. There was always the recognition uh, from as far back as I can remember that we were different, right? We were Jews. Uh, I always knew as, as, as early as I could remember that, you know, we were taught, you know, to be careful in exhibiting our identity publicly. In other words, Yes, people could know that you're Jewish. It's not as though it were a secret. They could go to the synagogue and see who's going to the synagogue. But it wasn't something that you advertised, even in progressive, tolerant, quote, Lebanon. You didn't wear a massive Star of David around your chain. Um, that's what we typically mean by tolerance in the Middle East. We tolerate you. We tolerate your existence until we decide not to. And that's, that's how my experience was. Uh, 
it was largely a happy childhood. And then once the war broke out, it was a profoundly unhappy childhood. Yo, so and uh, you emigrate to um, Canada in 1975. Exactly. At the age of 11. Uh, how were your first experience in a secular and democratic country like Canada? Right. Well, I guess the... the Compare. Right. So, I mean, I, I didn't necessarily understand the concepts of, you know, what secularism was at the age of 11. What I knew is that I didn't have to uh, watch out for snipers who were going to shoot me in the head or I wasn't going to be stopped at a roadblock and if I have to produce my identity card that says that we are Jewish, I would be shot on the spot. And I knew that I didn't have to worry about the whistle. I don't know if you know that when bombs come, uh, when they're about to land, there's a type of whistle that they do. And so to give you a sense of the type of childhood I had, I could know, and not just me, it was just part of life, you could know whether you had to take cover or not depending on the whistle signature of the bomb. So if, depending on the sound, uh, oh, you know, this is probably 400 meters away, you don't have to worry about it. Whereas, depending on the whistle, it might be hitting somewhere near your house. Well, when I came to Canada, uh, I had to worry about snow, not about bombs. And so, in that sense, uh, I think there was a relief that I could be somewhere and not worry that my family, that myself, were going to be killed. So that's really my first exposure. I, I remember my first day at uh, school. It was grade five, Iona Elementary School. Uh, I get there, and uh, I didn't speak any English at that point. Uh, I spoke, of course, Arabic. That was my mother tongue. I spoke uh, French, uh, but I didn't speak English. Uh, I knew some Hebrew at that point, then later learned it more. And so when the teacher introduces me and I spoke in French, this was an English uh, elementary school, uh, and, and I said, I am from Lebanon, but in French, the, the students kind of looked at me not knowing what that meant. And so I did a machine gun and I started doing as if I'm shooting with a machine gun to, to describe what Lebanon was, right? Uh, because the only way for me to describe Lebanon is to describe the killings and the butchery. So that those were my original experiences but then very quickly you know children are unbelievably adaptive uh, it's really quite remarkable i remember maybe a month after moving from lebanon uh, i went to my first uh, what they used to call them house parties uh, and then we went to a, a party in the basement where we started dancing and doing the slow dancing and within a month somehow i was canadian somehow lebanon was part of my history And now I was in this new land. I think if I were talking about the story when I was 40, I think the adaptation would have been much more difficult, as was the case for my parents. My parents had a lot more difficulty adjusting to Lebanon, uh, to Montreal. And so they ended up going back and forth to Lebanon, even after we had immigrated to Canada. Yeah, it's easier to adapt in younger age. Exactly. Of course, you talk about the education uh, and how and When did you become interested in psychology? Right. So, you know, I had, how, I had always had an interest in the behavioral sciences. At one point, I'd even contemplated whether I should study uh, clinical psychology or even I thought about maybe going to psychiatry. Uh, but I felt that a lot of the theoretical frameworks in the clinical world were uh, not very scientifically based, right? You could be a Freudian or you could be a Jungian or you could... So it was really driven by a lot of ideological gurus. And my training, my, my undergrad was in mathematics and computer science, and then I had done an MBA, which was also quite quantitative. And then I, when I went to pursue my MS and my PhD at Cornell, my original goal was to be a mathematical modeler of consumer behavior, right? So to, to study consumer behavior, but from a modeling, mathematical modeling perspective. And then I, I uh, met the person who became my eventual doctoral supervisor. Uh, his name is uh, J. Edward Russo. And he is a well-known uh, mathematical and cognitive psychologist. And he suggested during my first semester at Cornell in my doctoral studies, you know what, why don't you take some uh, psychology courses? Uh, because I think with your technical quantitative background. If you now sort of specialize in the behavioral sciences, it might be a nice mix. And so I took a advanced social psychology course among other behavioral courses. 
and my my career path completely changed. Uh, I went from being a guy who was likely to be a a mathematical modeler to eventually becoming a psychologist. Now, the evolutionary psychology part uh, was also accidental. During that first semester at Cornell, when I was taking the advanced social psychology course, the professor, his name is uh, Professor Dennis Regan, this was a social psychology course, not a biological psychology course. Halfway through the semester, roughly, he assigned a book called Homicide, uh, written by two Canadian evolutionary psychologists, uh, Martin Daly and Margot Wilson. And in, and in the book, they describe how, how you apply evolutionary theory to study criminal behavior. There are certain types of crimes that happen in exactly the same way for the exact same reasons, irrespective of which culture you come from, irrespective of which time period you're talking about. And so when I saw the, the power, the explanatory power of evolutionary psychology to explain human behavior, that's when I had the idea that I would eventually found the discipline of evolutionary consumption, which is the application of evolutionary psycho psychology to consumer psychology. So as, as often happens in life, some of these choices are, we meet them accidentally. Yeah, um, can you explain a little bit in detail what is consumer psychology? So consumer psychology is a very, very broad field that basically applies all of the frameworks of psychology specifically to the consumer setting. So you could study motivation theory, right, which is something that we study in psychology in general, but then you could apply it to consumer behavior. What are the things that motivate consumers? You could take perception theory, which is something that psychologists study, and then you could apply it to consumer behavior by looking at how does uh, our perceptual system affect the way that we process advertising. So all that consumer psychology is, is really the application of psychology as a cognate discipline, specifically to the context of uh, consumption. Now, in my case, in my work, I define the term consumption so broadly that you could pretty much fit anything under consumer behavior, right? So it's not just consuming Coca-Cola and consuming coffee and wearing jeans, but we consume religion, we consume friendships, we consume marriages, and so it becomes really just human behavior. Uh, and so that's really how, so in, in my case, I, I marry, if you'd like, consumption with psychology and with biology. Okay, thank you. Um, maybe we can go now to another topic. Uh, the first question may be too simple, but are you left or right? Right, that's, I, I've been asked this before, both privately and publicly, I, and, and I'm, I'm not going to, uh, the, the answer I'm going to give you is not one to try to avoid the, the answer, but it's an honest response. I despise those types of labels because, frankly, there are many positions uh, that would, quote, put me much more as a, as a guy on the left, and then there are other positions that would put me on the right. And so I'm really a man of ideas. I don't know if you took all of my positions, whether that would put me more on the right or the left. I mean, I would probably say I'm a libertarian. I'm a classical libertarian. Uh, so to give you an example of positions that would either fall on the left or the right, uh, when it comes to gay marriage, then I would be called a left guy. I, I don't care if, if gay, gay people get married. I support it. I don't give a damn. Uh, I, don't, uh, I think that women should have uh, the choice to the right to have an abortion if they want to. That would put me on the left. On the other hand, I am a proponent of the death penalty. I do believe that there are certain crimes uh, which, if presented with the right evidence, if you, if you are somebody who has raped, sodomized, and killed 10 children, and we have DNA proof that it is you, and that's incontrovertible, then I don't have a moral problem with killing you. As a matter of fact, one could argue that putting you in a uh, seven by 10 jail for the rest of your life might be more cruel. And so that would be something that would be more typical of a conservative right view. So I don't know if you take the totality of my positions where it would place me. I think that I would say that I'm a true liberal. A true liberal meaning that I believe in individual freedoms and individual rights, which is not what the liberals, for example, in Canada believe in. It's all about identity politics. It's all about the 
collective group rather than individuals. And in that sense, then I'm not a liberal. I'm a true liberal. So uh, thank you for the extent uh, answer. Um, the first question was intended to go on to the next question, and that is, uh, what is so regressive about the left? Well, it's because all of the positions that supposedly are progressive are actually not, right? Uh, so anybody who has a truly liberal, that's why I am, I say I am a true liberal. If you believe that all individuals have individual, have, have rights, uh, then how could you not stand alongside women who are being clobbered all over the Middle East, right? Uh, how could you be for, or how could you be silent when it comes to female genital mutilation? Or how could you be silent when it, come, when it comes to child brides or honor killings? Well, that, in this case, it's because the left, the left that I don't, that, that I think is the regressive left, uh, has a hierarchy of positions, if you'd like. And the worst possible thing you can do if you are a regressive is to attack people who are the other, the brown people, right? And therefore, when it comes to either defending women or, or attacking, say, Islam, well, then they will be quiet because it is racist and bigoted to attack supposedly Islam. So in that sense, they're actually regressive. They don't hold individual rights as important. I mean, how could you be for gay rights and march, uh, you know, in San Francisco, but then be completely quiet about the way that uh, homosexuals are treated in the Middle East? That's regressive. That's not liberal. And so the problem with the left is that they have a real massive blind spot when it comes to certain realities that happen to a protected class of people called, quote, brown people. And that's wrong. And we should be able to speak openly whenever a grievance is, happens, is happening. And that's why someone like Sam Harris, uh, who is attacked by the regressive left, is actually a true liberal because he doesn't care about what your skin color is or where you come from or what your religion is. He believes that people have the dignity of individual rights. That's a true liberal. Yes, and the situation at the universities uh, also changed. Have you experienced the uh, thought police, police at your campus yourself? I mean, not in a direct way. Not that, you know, an administrator has ever come to me and said, you better stop saying this, or not that a student group has ever. So in that sense, uh, I've been fortunate uh, to, to not have had this. But I certainly know that in being a very outspoken and open academic in taking these politically incorrect positions, I know that it makes many of my colleagues uh, uncomfortable because they wish to be part of the herd. They wish to stay politically correct. They wish to never uh, say anything that might offend anybody. And when somebody comes along very truthfully and says, wait a second, here's a problem here, here's a problem there, then I know for a fact that some of these people um, are uncomfortable with my, uh, this, my discourse. Now, some of them will write to me privately. A lot of them will write to me privately and say, hey, you know, you're such a hero. We, we respect your work so much. But then they won't want to publicly say so by liking my Facebook post, right? Because then maybe somebody will think they're politically incorrect. So it's in that sense that I have felt the thought police. It, it hasn't been a direct attack, but it's there. You know it's there. It's a censorship in the head, I think. When everybody uh, talk free, um, that would be better. Exactly right. So this is the atmosphere, or kind of atmosphere of fear, I think. Um, And who uh, who define what is offending uh, or not? Exactly right. Uh, but you're, exa you're, you're exactly right that self-censorship is ultimately, you know, one of the most pernicious and dangerous forms of censorship because it's not that somebody else is shutting me down. It's that I now have been taught what is correct for me to say and what is not. And if I'm going to, if I want to be part of the club, then I better keep my mouth shut. And I'm simply not made that way. The way that my, my personhood is made is I speak openly and honestly. And if my ideas are bad, then let they be judged 
and let better ideas defeat my ideas. But to shut up because you are being politically incorrect, for me, it's the height of intellectual dishonesty, right? If you are a true academic, if you are a true public intellectual, then there is a mechanism by which ideas are judged. Put them out there, let everybody debate them, and either your idea wins or loses. But to shut myself up because uh, person A or B might think that I'm politically erect, incorrect, I, I don't do that. Yes, we have also experience here with this uh, invitation for lectures who drawn back, and Richard Dawkins himself experienced uh, this kind uh, in January, I think, uh, he w where he was uh, invited to a conference in New York, and he, he tweeted uh, animation, uh, short animation, and then he was uh, de-invited de from this conference. I know, I... With, uh, Oh, only uh, without any discussion. It's, Nobody asked him before what what about. It's unbelievable. Look, Ayan Hersey Alley uh, was supposed to give a, I think, commencement speech at Brandeis University, or she was going to receive an award. I don't remember the exact details. And this is, Brandeis University is a university that was set up. I mean, it's it's quote a Jewish university in that it has a big Jewish history. Brandeis himself was somebody who supported, you know, liberal ideas, free speech. And it was the many of the professors at Brandeis, right? They're supposed to be the bastions of liberty and freedom and free thought. They were the ones who were sort of at the forefront of disinviting her, right? So if someone like uh, Ayan Hersey Ali, who comes from an Islamic background, who is herself Somali, she's black, she's a woman, she's experienced fe female genital mutilation, she's experienced the horrors of being forced to marry somebody that she doesn't want to marry, and hence not having the freedom of her reproductive rights. Uh, if this person is somebody that is persona non grata at Brandeis University, then the moral compass is broken, right? The whole narrative yes, is out course. the window. So, so <laughs> of course. Of course. She is kind of expert, and uh, if she treated it this way, everybody can treat it this way. I mean, imagine you trying to say something, right? You're the well, white... We do it here in Germany. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. I'm glad to hear it. <coughs> we have also similar problems here, but not on this level uh, as in the United States, especially as a universities. Um, but uh, similar problems, of you, course. You mean in terms with of political, political correctness? This, this is a part of, I think, this self censorship is a part of the, of the political correctness. And that's a problem. Big, big problem. It's, it's not about to offend somebody, but it's about to uh, say your opinion, and then we have a discussion about it, uh, and then we get solutions. So that's that's the way we, we uh, maybe we. we Want to do it well and not I, the other way around and, and i to, to add to what you're saying i mean it depends what your highest objective is right as an academic as a public intellectual as a scientist my biggest responsibility what wakes what makes me wake up in the morning and feel excited about the world is that i try to pursue truth to the best of my ability that's what drives me now, if, on the other hand, what drives you, if you are part of the regressive left or what I call the ostrich brigade or the castrati brigade, if your objective is to minimize offense, well, the reality is that some truths are offensive to somebody, right? If I criticize a religion in my pursuit of truth, in my pursuit of reason, the consequence of that is that somebody is going to be offended. But that's why we have freedom of speech, right? We have freedom of speech, not so that I can, so that you could tell me, my goodness, you have beautiful green eyes. We have freedom of speech so that you could tell me, you know what? I think that Judaism is a bunch of bullshit and you should be allowed to say that. If it offends me, well, that's too bad. And so that's, I think, the big confrontation that's happening. What is the driving goal of intellectuals? Is it to discuss, debate, ridicule, mock, defend ideas, or is it to not offend anybody? Well, if it's the latter, then we get self-censorship. Yeah, you know, when you um, criticize an idea, and, and this idea is uh, religion, so the people take it personal. So uh, most uh, think when you criticize 
maybe Islam, you also criticize Muslims. But this is not the case. You only criticize the idea, the ideology, not the, not the people. And, you know, it's funny. So, it, this is such a trivially simple point to understand, and yet it is astonishing how many people don't understand it. And not just idiotic people. I mean, my academic colleagues don't understand this point, right? Just yesterday I was having an exchange with somebody who said, well, you know, uh, by attacking Islam, that's not really fair. You know, one should attack Islamism because, you know, my uh, father-in-law is Muslim and he prays and he's a very pious man, yet he doesn't do all those bad things. Well, again, here he is conflating the individual with the doctrines, right? Individual people, individual Muslims can be very nice or could be very mean simply because of the random combination of their genes, right? People, they are bad Jews and good Jews, bad atheists, good atheists, bad Muslims, good Muslims. But the fact that you are a secular Muslim or you are tolerant and peaceful, that doesn't speak to Islam. It speaks to you as an individual who is decent and kind. And that's very different than what the doctrines of Islam say. And the example that I typically give, and again, it is so profoundly simple, yet so f many people make the mistake, I eat pork. I'm Jewish. The fact that I eat pork does not imply that Judaism allows the consumption of pork. I eat pork despite my Judaism, right? It's a very simple concept, yet people constantly conflate this idea of individual Muslims with Islamic doctrines. Yeah, and in addition, many people think you uh, you can't criticize religion. This is the exemption. You can criticize everything, but not religion. Exactly. And it's, and, also, it's also a problem. And, and, and of course, I mean, that is, that is true as a general statement, but of course we know that in the pragmatic world that we live in, not all religions are equally uh, accepting of being criticized, right? There are something like 10,000 religions in the world. <laughs> Some say more. Uh, if you include all the different sects of Christianity, it could get up to 30,000 or whatever the number is. Uh, yet there is really only one today that you better be careful about criticizing. And that's simply unacceptable, right? I mean, if you wish to be part of the secular, liberal, pluralistic, tolerant world, then you have to let go of these very bad uh, reflexes. If you can't, then you're not welcome to be in our societies. So, um, talk about, again, about the regressive, so-called regressive left, uh, what do you think, why they support Islam? Uh, also, Islam is opposite to uh, many values of the, of the left, like uh, women's rights, gay rights, freedom of speech, and so on. So, there are several uh, answers to this sort of complex question. Uh, I'll give you at least two. So, there's a book that was written by Jamie Glazoff, who's a historian, uh, I think the title of the book is United in Hate. And, and precisely the book's premise is how the left and Islam are in bed together, right? So they are united in hate. And hate of who? Of the West, right? So when you share a common enemy, right? Uh, you know, the U.S. is the great Satan. Israel and the Jews are the second Satan. Capitalism is evil and so on and so forth. Then if you can find an ideology that also sings the same tune, uh, well, then maybe we should get married for a while. And then once we kill our common enemy or destroy our common enemy, then we can resolve the issue. Now, of course, <clears throat> if the West were to uh, be destroyed and if it were left between the left and Islam, I can predict very quickly for you who's going to win that battle. Uh, but the idiots on the left don't realize this. And so that's one answer. And that is that uh, the enemy... Uh, you know, we have a common enemy, therefore we're friends. Uh, but I so also, this sounds like enemy of my enemy is my friend. No? Exactly right. Uh, secondly, I think that, you know, we talked about the sort of hierarchy of victimhood and so on. So also, I mean, it's called the Oppression Olympics. It's also called victimology poker. Uh, right now, in the discourse of the victimology narrative, the highest poker hand is if you're Muslim. Okay, that, that's it. That, that trumps everything else. 
Uh, now, the reasons why that came to be, we could discuss. But the bottom line is, we know that in this game of victimology poker, that's the top hand that you could hold. And therefore, what happens with the leftists is that once you introduce a card that says Islam, then all other issues are eviscerated, are evaporated, right? So, so yes, we are for gay rights, but if the if if the Muslims are throwing people off the you know the the buildings, then shh, we have no right to say anything. Yes, we are for women's right, but if the clitorises are being cut in Islamic countries, shh, we've got nothing to say, right? And so, it, it it's a form of religious belief right but instead of you know instead of believing in a god you just believe a narrative out of faith and so right that's now that's double standards no it, exactly and, double standards and no? that's what you were saying i think when you were mentioning about the 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 tweet that richard dawkins put out of my of my clip what i was doing there so to speak to your double standard i was referring there to the concept which i'm, I'm sure you've heard the the uh, soft bigotry of lowered expectations which basically says, and the, the specific uh, clip that Richard was kind enough to, to, to tweet about of, of mine, is, is a clip where I was describing the following uh, situation. So I was, I was remarking on the fact that I often criticize all religions, right? I mean, I, I'll put up a clip about some, uh, you know, Orthodox Jew on a plane, you know, causing all sorts of problems because of his religious beliefs. Or I could talk about some uh, Christian fundamentalist senator who is an evolution denier, right? Uh, and usually people are very happy to see those criticisms on my Facebook page and especially my academic friends. You know, it's very progressive to criticize all these religions. And then one day I put a clip. I didn't even, I didn't even interpret the clip. I didn't, even, I didn't add any editorial stuff. I, I put a clip up that was showing a Iraqi astronomer, right, a scientist, who was arguing that the earth is flat and he was quoting certain Quranic passages that demonstrate that it is true that the earth is flat okay and so I put this up to demonstrate you know the the, the lunacy of religion right how it could take sophisticated minds and completely parasitize them with garbage okay now what do you think happened a fellow scientist from uh, California she, I think she lives in California who is an evolutionist, if I remember correctly, responded with sort of the following, I'm paraphrasing what she said, and her, her position was, you know, why are you ganging up on these people? Why are you attacking these people, right? So here is a scientist who was not offended that a fellow scientist was saying that the earth was flat. She was offended that I would point to him. And why was she offended? Because, of course, he's Muslim, and you shouldn't criticize Muslim scientists if they say the most idiotic things possible. And so that is a manifestation of the bigotry, the soft bigotry of low expectations. And that's what Richard Dawkins had tweeted. <laughs> yeah, I get the feeling that religion is always the exemption from the rule. Right. So, uh, <laughs> so um, here in Europe, uh, and especially in Germany, we uh, face an immigration of large numbers of Muslim uh, since last year. What do you think about this? How would this change uh, Europe and especially Germany? We're talking about over one million and uh, more are coming. Well, and may, mo mainly, mainly a high percentage of young Muslim men. Right. Uh, I, I, I did a clip recently on my YouTube channel uh, where I pointed to the Dalai Lama and I said that clearly the Dalai Lama must be a Nazi, bigoted, racist monster because he has said, as you probably know, that uh, the immigration situation in Europe and specifically in Germany is completely out of control. And so anything that he said is certainly no different than what Trump has said. But Trump is a Nazi, apparently. But the Dalai Lama got a pass. My position is very, very clear and very simple. Uh, if you discriminate against people's skin color, that's irrational, that's crazy, that's bigoted, that makes no sense in a civilized society. If you discriminate against people's sexual orientation or their biological sex, that makes no sense. And so there are cases of bigotry that thankfully the West is slowly getting 
rid of. On the other hand, if you discriminate against people because their values are perfectly antithetical to yours, then you'd have to be somebody who is brainless. You're, you're void of a brain to not recognize that there will be a problem. So nobody is discriminating against so-called brown people. I'm a brown person. I'm from Lebanon, right? Uh, my Arabic is my mother tongue. But when I came to Mon Montreal, Canada, my family didn't try to overthrow or get special compensation for our culture. We assimilated. We were proud to be Canadians. And that's it. Full stop. I'm first Canadian before I am Jewish or anything else, right? Because Canada accepted me. That's the country that took me in when I could have otherwise been killed. So what happens with the immigrants that are coming from these countries, many of them are perfectly lovely, peaceful, normal people that don't want to do anything bad. The problem is you don't know who's who. Right. And many of them might not be ISIS members, but their values, both culturally and religiously, are not ones that are consistent with Western liberal secular values. And so how do we decide who's good, who's bad? So therefore, it is wrong to shut the door to everybody, because, again, then we lose the capacity, the humanity of bringing in people who are decent. Right. So therefore, whatever Donald Trump says when he says ban all Muslims, clearly that's got to be wrong. But opening the floodgates and letting every look when you invite people to, you, to your house party, you, you, the size of your house determines whether you can invite 10 people or 10,000 people. If you invite 10,000 people, your house is going to be a bit too crowded and the party won't go too well. And so therefore, there has to be some common sense that is introduced into this reality. Having a million people, forgetting about the fact that they are Muslim, having a million people come in wave after wave doesn't make sense. It's not a way that is sustainable. And so my general position is that uh, Germany is going to pay very, very dearly for Mother uh, uh, Merkel's errors. Yes, this, this could be. And uh, of course, uh, when you have a migration, uh, like uh, migration in the USA, you need a green card to work. And this is controlled migration. This is uncontrolled migration. This is a, this is a, a big difference, of I'm course. And uh, in addition, uh, a survey from, I think, 2013 uh, in six European countries, uh, this is a result that uh, two thirds of Muslims uh, think that the uh, religious um, laws are above the the secular laws. This is also a problem, of course, because when you think your holy books, this is what counts, and the secular laws is uh, below them. This is a, this, this could be a problem. Well, look, we have a future. of course uh, we we have a I mean not not quite not nearly as serious a situation as you have in Germany. But our new prime minister, as I like to call him, the castrato in chief, the head of the regressive, Justin Trudeau, uh, the king of the virtue signalers, uh, has uh, opened the doors. I mean, not like Merkel, but I think he's let in now 25,000 Syrians and he's trying to increase it. Now, to, get, to put this in context, typically, and I've spoken to a lot of recent refugees uh, prior to this sort of mass wave, uh, it takes, you know, 12 to 18 months to vet a person, a single person, 12 to 18 months, one person, right? But somehow now magically, we've been able to vet 25,000 people and absolutely guarantee that they are all wonderful, loving, peaceful people that will never cause problems. I mean, you don't need to be Einstein to recognize that you're gambling with people's futures, right? I, I just gave a story uh, in one of my uh, recent, my most recent sad truth clips, uh, where I discussed how uh, uh, at my son's daycare they they asked all the kids to be returned home because there was an unattended uh, bag that was left, and so they were very worried. This reality is not something that we would have faced five years ago in Montreal. This is something that is part of my childhood in Lebanon. But as we create these very, very open door policies, we're going to have more and more of this problem. Now, of course, the unfortunate thing here is that there are a great number of people that are coming 
that are lovely and, and wonderful. But the reality is that we can't risk, you know, opening the door just because we might be shutting down the door on nice people. There has to be a controlled policy of immigration. There should be common sense, of course. Yeah. Okay, that's other questions. Oh, wonderful. Um, thank you very much for the interview. My pleasure. And I'm sure we could talk uh, hours and hours, but not today, maybe another time. Thank Love. you very much. Thank you so much for inviting me. Cheers. Do Dr. Saad. Thank you, okay. sir. Okay. Bye-bye.